Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. In this world, you will have tribulation, trouble, said a man who that very evening would be stabbed in the back by a close friend, abandoned by all who knew and loved him, arrested by an angry mob, roughed up, accused and condemned of things he didn't do, and finally, be marched off to die all alone on a cross where his loved ones could get no closer than looking on from a distance, couldn't come and reach and hold on to his dying hand, could get no closer to him than a stick and a sponge soaked in wine vinegar. In this world, you will have trouble. Sounds to me like divine understatement when you think about it from Jesus' perspective. And it's clear that of all of the things going through Jesus' mind on that Maundy Thursday evening as he was speaking to his disciples, one of the troubles that was front and center was that every single one of those men sitting at the table with him was very quickly going to leave him. And he would have to face all of that trouble all alone. The thought was distressing even to Jesus. He had to turn away from his close friends and turn instead to his father to find the assurance and the confidence to say, yet I am not alone. And friends, of all of the troubles that might beset us in this world, the one that sticks out to me as I hear today's gospel is this one. I'm sure that you have heard the news stories, read the articles, seen the statistics. All of them say that even though we're more connected than ever, despite all of the technology that can connect us to one another, we're also lonelier than ever before. There's a great irony at work here if you, if you look around this room and figure that there's at least 80 or 90 phones in people's pockets, and each one of those phones has, what, 100 or 200, 300 plus contacts that you at this moment could pull out your phone and call, or you could start a texting conversation with with any one of those people. And yet, sometimes we find ourselves compulsively checking our phone and growing more and more disappointed when there's no text waiting for us. As it dawns on us that of the hundreds of contacts we have and hundreds of people who have our number, not one of them at that moment is thinking of me. You know, loneliness like that doesn't come about usually by any great dramatic happening. It doesn't require an angry mob to convince your friends that now would be a good time for them to revisit their best times in the 400-meter dash to feel lonely in this world. Jesus was abandoned in a great and dramatic fashion. The loneliness that we feel might not be as dramatic, but it is there, and it is a worldly trouble such as Jesus was talking about. And it comes to us in many forms and at all points in life, doesn't it? From the child who feels like no one gets them. Like there's no friend out there for them who is on the same wavelength. To the teens and above who thinks to the devices they have are treated to the photos of what they are missing out on in real time. To stay-at-home moms who are desperate for a conversation with an adult because they've been talking to a three-year-old all day. To empty nesters who arrive home after a busy day at work to a house that is just way too quiet. To old people who say with a degree of bitterness, why am I still lingering here? Everyone else is already gone. Loneliness comes and it strikes, and that is really only the loneliness that could be expected from a fairly simple and straightforward life. It says nothing of the loneliness that is born from greater troubles that might afflict us in this world. But about the isolation that comes from depression 
and a mind that starts to view as one's enemies those who would be your friends. What about the loneliness that springs from a divorce or an abusive relationship? What of the emptiness that accompanies an unexpected and untimely death? You know, we here in the church are fond of saying that we are a haven for people in the rough times of life. That here we are brothers and sisters to bear one another's burdens, to carry each other along. And it sounds wonderful, but I wonder if that's really the case. Or could it be that sometimes we add insult to injury and hit people when they're down? Perhaps the stigma of the divorce keeps you at arm's length from the divorcee. Or not wanting to make matters worse keeps you from texting the person who's struggling with depression. Perhaps not knowing what to say hinders you from paying a visit to the one who's grieving or stuck in an abusive relationship. You know, recently I I read a woman who was complaining that we in the church are more welcoming to convicted criminals than to women who have had an abortion. We have prison ministries, she said, but a woman who's had an abortion is made to bear the lonely struggle of grief all alone for fear of what her fellow Christians would think or say if only they knew what she had done. Are we in the church a place where loneliness is relieved and where Christ's forgiveness animates our relationships? Or are we no better than Jesus' disciples? You know, come to think of it, it was the church that let Jesus down. It was those men who that very night had been sitting at the table receiving his supper from his own hand who an hour or two later were headed for the bushes and abandoning Jesus and leaving him at that moment and trusting his care to his most bitter enemies. Thanks a lot, guys, is what we're tempted to say when others let us down. But not Jesus. He stood all alone and there by himself he found peace comfort in the faithfulness of his father. He was abandoned by all, even by the father himself, and yet in that moment he took heart and he had courage and he cried out to my God, my God. And that Jesus bore the cross alone matters because he bore it in loneliness for you and for me. He endured, and he overcame. When all others left him, Jesus put his trust in his Father, and the Father did not let him down. Where is Jesus now? Is he not living forever with his Father? Is he not seated there at the right hand of the Father in all glory, ruling over all things? Is he not awaiting the day and the hour when he will return? And we will see him and he will gather us, his people, to himself to live with him and the Father and to live with one another for all eternity in the place where there will be no loneliness whatsoever, forever. You know, Jesus' victory, the fact that he overcame What does it mean for us when feelings of loneliness are close at heart? Understand this. When Jesus speaks of tribulation or trouble, he's speaking of those things in this world which cause us distress. And if you want to understand the great peace and comfort that comes from Jesus' victory, you have to first put your finger on the specific distress that loneliness causes. As I think of it, loneliness causes three specific distresses. The first one is this. Loneliness makes us think 
There is no one who knows me. No one who knows what it's like to be me and to be going through what I'm going through. There's no one who gets it. No one who understands. And that is a troubling thought. But friends, it's not true. Take heart. Look. Jesus knows. And he understands. Jesus felt abandonment and abuse. Jesus was forsaken and alone. And he knows what it's like to be you. In fact, he knows you better than you know yourself. There is nothing that you could ever say to Jesus in prayer that would surprise him. Before a word is on your lips, he knows exactly what you are going to say. He knows you perfectly and completely. And that's fine and good, but still you might say, it doesn't matter if there is no one who cares. Loneliness can make you think, even if there is someone out there who knows what it's like to be going through what I'm going through, it matters not one bit if they don't care about me. And that too is a troubling thought, isn't it? But friends, it's not true. The Father loves you, cares for you so much that he sent his Son into this world and turned his back on him to welcome you with open arms. And the Son loves you and cares for you so much that he stood all alone in a garden and on a cross and was laid by himself in a tomb so that there is nothing at all in this world that could ever separate you from his love and care and concern. And that is true, and yet still you might say, it does no good if there is no one who is there for me. Loneliness makes us think, no one is willing to give me the time of day. I have no one to listen to me. I have no one who's willing to spend some time with me. And that is a troubling thought, but it's not true either. Jesus tells you to pray. He says, ask that your joy may be full. And he means it. When you go to God in prayer, you have his undivided attention. It's not like prayer means waiting in line for your 20 seconds before the divine. Not at all. Our Father in heaven, his ears are open to hear all the prayers of all his people all the time. And when you pray, you can be assured that you have God's undivided attention, that he listens, that he hears, that he gives you exactly what is best just for you. Loneliness confronts us with the reality that it's treacherous to put our confidence in any other human being. They might indeed let us down, abandon us, or forsake us, even as Jesus' disciples abandoned him. And yet can we not, with Jesus, turn to our God and with confidence say, I am not alone. The Father is with me. Can we not believe that that is true by virtue of our baptism where we were first called his children and we first looked to him as our true Father? And by the fact that Jesus comes to us and shares the closest bond as he gives us his true body and blood, can we not believe that Jesus is still keeping his promise to be with us by the very fact that his word is being spoken today, that he put a preacher here for you to listen and to hear his voice and to know that he is with you always, even to the very end of the age. Though everyone else might let us down, our God will never (coughs) fail us. He is entirely faithful 
and eternally present. But I still have something to say to us about one another. You know, Jesus' disciples abandoned him. They left Jesus all alone, and it was okay. It was Jesus. But the disciples didn't abandon each other. Actually, we find them together, huddling behind closed doors in fear, yes, but together. And the fact that God has brought us together in this place, that is no small thing, nothing to be taken for granted. For our brothers and sisters, should we not be willing to spare all time and energy and attention? in seeing to it that there is no one who would come here and feel like they are alone, unseen, or unwanted. We are the family of God. And to be a true brother or sister is to overcome the world and to point them to Christ is to share in his victory. Jesus urges us to pray, to ask in his name, and what better things could we pray for in his name than for a heart of faith that believes that our God is ever with us and a heart of love that wishes to extend his peace to those he has brought into our lives. Amen. Please stand.